forgiveness. Blue skies, white puffy clouds, and light. Forgive me. Forgive me for having allowed me my pain to get the best of me. Forgive me for letting my pride get in the way. Forgive me for causing you so much pain. I waited over 27 years to hear those words from my mother, and the words never came. Mija, perdóname por haberte abandonado. My daughter, forgive me for having abandoned you. Forgive me for not being there to protect you. Forgive me for walking out. And those words never came either. So imagine this little girl that grew up in a border town. And when I was little, I used to be fascinated with the clouds and flying, and I would look up at the sky, and I would see the planes go by, and in my mind, I would make up stories. And in those planes, I would see stories, and I would think about all the adventures that I was going to go on. And I think what I was really doing was looking for a way out. See, even though I had a beautiful childhood, had a wonderful mother who provided me everything I needed and she did her best, it also came with a lot of pain, my childhood. And so somehow as a little girl, that was my way of escaping. And when I, when in, in doing that escaping, what I realized is that forgiveness is about shining light into darkness. How does that happen? Well, I can't even explain it to you, but I remember being a little girl about this tall, out in my backyard. It was dark one night, and I'm looking up at the stars, and tears are rolling down my eyes. And I was being punished, so I was outside picking up my toys, my clothes, and the tears were rolling down. And I remember thinking to myself, the pattern stops with me. I was little. I didn't know how it was going to stop. I just knew that it was going to stop with me. Do you ever feel that way? And so I was looking for ways to shine light into my darkness. And I was looking for ways to get to the next level in my life. And when we allow ourselves the power of freedom, it is so freeing to forgive ourselves and forgive one another. Many of us have learned that conflict is unproductive. See, when I was a child, I had a lot of conflict in my life. Why? I don't know if you can relate. I'm a little strong-willed. Right? See the smiles out there, right? I'm a little strong-willed. So, so you can imagine maybe what that household was like when I was a child. And there was a lot of conflict in, in my household. A lot of beauty and light and joy, and a, a, probably an equal amount of conflict. What we learn, though, to deal with conflict is that we shy away from it, we fear it because of the unproductive consequences of fear, anger, blame, and resentment, and those are all feelings that get us stuck in where we are. So we're afraid to take another step. And sometimes it can feel like there are dark clouds looming over us, and we're just looking for that little, little peephole that's a pocket of light for us to rise above. And that happened again in 2011 in my life. I went through a tough divorce, never expected that. And even through all that anguish and that pain, I was still holding out for that little pocket of light because somehow I knew that on the other side of that, there was going to be an amazing life and journey waiting for me. So I kept taking the next step. And what is the next step? Forgiveness is a choice. There is power in forgiveness. I know maybe some of you in the audience are sitting here thinking, well, I know I'm a little control freak. I know you're out there because you're not making eye contact with me. Those of us that like to control situations, if you look at the fact that by the very essence of making a choice to forgive, you are already putting yourself in the pilot seat or the driver's seat. The choice is to keep your heart open. 
because there will be many things in our lives that challenge us and they will push our buttons and our choice is to stay open and open and wait for the lesson and wait for the glory that is on the other side of that. So forgiveness is a choice. This picture I took up, I was at an air show and there were two airplanes that made this hard and I thought, how amazing, right? Just the perfect power of choosing and being in our heart. The thing is, while forgiveness is a choice, it's also a journey. It's a journey that starts in our head and it travels down to our heart. And depending on how big your head is, it might be a long journey. <laughs> you know, I'm a thinker. I like to think things. I like to analyze them. And sometimes when we analyze and overanalyze, we can get stuck. And so that journey can be a little bit longer. So what I encourage you to do is really to open your heart because it's really the distance is quite short from here to here. It's a journey from being in your head where all your stories are, the pain, the past, who hurt me, who wronged me, and we get stuck in that past. Or because of that, we fast forward to the future and we worry, we get anxious. What if it doesn't work? What if, what if, what if? The power is in the present moment and your present moment is to choose. That's where we come from, our heart. So our heart is the opportunity for us to look at life with compassion and kindness. When I was looking for a way to move to the next level, this is what my life was like in 1999. I had a huge spiritual awakening. And around that moment, this is a picture up in St. Lucia, my life felt like it was like rocky terrain, and there was smoke coming out. What you don't see in this picture is a little to the left, there is one of the most gorgeous waterfalls that, that are, I've ever seen. And I was searching for a way to make my life be more beautiful and allow that water to stream down and heal me. And so what did I do? I started to ask questions and I figured out, still remember the moment I was driving on the highway, 287 south to the 24 east ramp, and I had an epiphany. And it was as if I, this, this immense amount of love just poured into my heart. And I immediately went to seeing my mother as a little girl. Because I thought, how can I heal the pain that I have? And I went to see the child within. That's my mom up there on the left. She's walking the labyrinth in Block Island. And that little girl up there, that's, that's me. So what I did is I looked at, if I was a little girl, she would probably have been my best friend because I like to stick up for the underdog. It's just how I am. And I started to look at ways to heal that. So I thought, I wanted to understand her whys. Why did she do all those things? And so I started to ask my mom questions. Mom, what did you love to do when you were a little girl? Oh, I used to love to climb this tree, the tallest tree, and there were two branches that set out like this. And I would sit right in the middle of the branches, and I would sway in the wind, and I called it my airplane. Ah, oh, my mom loved to fly too. And she said, you know, and I would fight for my airplane because that was the freedom. That's where she went to run away from it all. Mom, what was it like to grow up in Mexico and be in a family of 12 and be number seven? in the pecking order. Why did my grandmother hit you when you wanted to study? Why did you have to hide under the bed to read your books? How did that feel? And I opened my heart and I listened. Why did she tell you you were ugly? You're beautiful. You're the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. And why didn't you say something, Mom? So I started to look at this little girl, my mother. And my heart just blew wide open. So in finding my way, if you look here, this is a labyrinth over in Block Island. A labyrinth has been known for many years as a ritual of taking a path. There's only one path in and one path out. And that path is a path to our heart. The journey in the center of the earth is the path right to our heart. So how do we find the way? I was looking in my life really to be, from everything that I learned in my life experiences, to be a bridge to connect others. To connect others to one another and to help you bring a connection to yourself. So along the way, there are no coincidences. I was at a conference, a business conference, and 
My background in education is sociology, all the people stuff. And yes, I've learned a lot about this, but it wasn't until this one now mentor of mine was up on stage talking about different personalities and behaviors. And what he said is that, you know, we've been intrigued with human behavior as far back as the time of Hippocrates. Fast forward it to the late 30s, early 40s, William Marston came in, talked about psych psychology and understanding people. And what he, what he talked about there was really that there were different personality styles. He gave lots of personality assessments. And no matter how many assessments he would do, there were always four unique styles that would rise to the top. Always the same four. And even though there were four styles, all of us were blends of the styles. And what I learned here and by understanding others is that we need to practice what I call the platinum rule. The platinum rule means I am going to speak to you the way you would like me to speak to you, not the way I want to speak to you because that's how I know and you should just conform to me. It's I'm going to learn what works for you so that you and I can have a greater connection together. So how do we connect with one another? Very simple. We ask ourselves two very basic questions. Question number one is, how fast does a motor run? There are people that are very outgoing. You see them walking around campus. They're moving, they talk fast, they come at you. Here's how these people process information. They talk it out loud. Sometimes in conflict, they will blurt things out before thinking about what they say. Then there are reserved people. Reserved people are a little bit, maybe slower paced, cautious, think things through. They often may not express what they're thinking. They stuff their emotions until one day they explode, right? That's the way we're wired. So the second question then you ask is, which way does the compass point? The compass can point to task or it can point to people. If I'm task oriented, I'm about form and function and I want to get things done. And things have to happen in a logical approach. If I am more people oriented, my connection is with sharing, caring, relationships, and connections. So we also approach conflict differently. Those of us that are task-oriented, we might have a hard time taking feelings into consideration. Those of us that are people-oriented, we might get our feelings hurt quite often. By the way, if you haven't figured it out, I'm on the people-oriented side. Now, when you put all this together, you get a model of human behavior that looks at these four unique styles. The top two, the dominant and inspiring styles, they're the outgoing ones. They're dominant, they're direct, they're doers, they're drivers. The inspiring styles, they're impressionable, intuitive, they like to have fun. The supportive styles and the cautious styles are more on the reserve side. Supportive, stable, steady, sweet. The cautious style, careful, compliant, critical thinkers. They, they all have different needs. The need of a dominant style is to have challenges, choices, and control. Remember that control thing we talked about earlier? The inspiring people, their need is for fun, for excitement, and for recognition. The supportive people, their need is to be appreciated, to be helped, and to be supported. And for the cautious people, their need is excellence, quality, values. That's what they seek. And when we all have a breach in that in ourselves, it becomes tough for us to connect with one another. Why? Because we're not speaking each other's language. So let me tell you a little bit about how we act when we are upset in conflict. Us dominant styles, boy, we can become very assertive, direct, and attacking of the problem. Firing, we play, we make jokes. Sometimes we deflect blame. Supportive styles, well, we might retreat, hide. And cautious styles, we tend to nitpick and analyze things. You know you're out there. <laughs> so, what it, so what do we do with this information? We can take these, these learnings and look at freeing ourselves through what I call the four A's of freedom. The first one is for us to actually have an awareness of ourselves. Awareness of how we show up in conflict. How do we show up with others? Then to have the ability, actually do something, have an ability, walk through that conflict. 
have a positive attitude. Believe in the power of love and forgiveness. If I didn't believe in it, I wouldn't be here today. And last but not least, action. Move forward and take action. Isn't it time that we lightened our load? Life is too short for us to get stuck there. One of my favorite pictures in aviation, I took this on the Hudson River Corridor. This is who? The Statue of Liberty, right? We call her the lady. The lady represents freedom. My wish for you and my deepest desire is that you allow your heart to open and that you experience the freedom and forgiveness. Will you come fly with me?